Um, so first, uh, I would like to introduce myself. So I am uh, Irvin, and uh, I am calling from uh, Harare um, and in Zimbabwe. Um, and I, I'll be holding, I'll be holding space for today's uh, dialogue uh, on my body, my journey. Um, but first, before <laughs> so, so uh, first before we jump into it, I just want to share a little bit of the context of the methods we're using. Um, so we are using um, uh, the principles of really trying to invite everybody to engage into dialogue uh, and, and, and practice really listening. A, and okay, can you hear me properly now? You are a little um, distorted uh, on my end. Oh, uh, is oh, this now better? You yes. Okay, uh, <laughs> maybe I don't have to shake uh, my gadgets a lot um body movement limit so i was just saying that um so this is really um the space we are creating is to really engage into dialogue and practice debate um but to really to, to, to really journey deeper into inquiry with so much curiosity of wanting to uh, to meet and to understand the other. So we have a virtual talking piece that we'll be using, uh, but since we are two, <laughs> we'll be just uh, paying attention to each other. Uh, so basically uh, for me, the talking piece that I brought with me today is, um, is this, um, oops, uh, this is my, <laughs> my diffuser, it's pretty much, um, uh, you know, like it helps me cleanse my space, cleanse my house, and I thought that maybe I can bring it as a separate, sacred object to the talking piece. So when we are talking, uh, you can just uh, take the talking piece virtually and hold it, and uh, I will give you as much uh, time uh, as you want to talk. Uh, and yeah. So... <laughs> Just to jump into it directly, uh, the reason why we uh, we called for this session uh, directly, uh, we were uh, I was working with my colleague uh, Rodrigo Gima, and we are working on the vertical code the system the system um, where we were trying to to challenge the societal norms uh, that, are, that are faced um, uh, by the queer uh, individuals uh, globally. Um, and we were like, okay, so why can't we really talk about bodies uh, and how bodies are accepted uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the society? You know, like what is the narrative the society is giving to, the, uh, to our bodies? How do we relate to our bodies? Uh, and, and, and this is pretty much um, a dialogue that everybody uh, can feel connected to and also potentially contribute to. Um, and this is, I feel like this is where I'm just gonna leave it. And the invitation I can just put at the center is maybe just to take a moment to pause a little and then to share, you know, from, 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 from our experiences, either from work, uh, either from uh, the community, uh, our daily lives, like how do we relate uh, with our bodies and uh, how do we relate to the society uh, in our bodies? and uh, how do we how do we get challenged by the society and how are we are we working with that so it's really a, a very open uh, discussion 
So I put uh, the peace at the center. I'll pick up the piece. <laughs> um, <laughs> such an interesting topic, isn't it? Um, something that impacts everybody. And I think, so for me, the thing that kind of comes up for me is um, I didn't grow up being taught to love my body or accept my body um, for so many different reasons um, because of the world I grew up in. So I grew up in a very white world. Um, and I was often the only um, black person, person of color anywhere. Um, the religious environment I grew up in as well, there was a lot of shame attached to body. Um, so yeah, I think I'm definitely on a journey still learning to, to understand how I can better connect with my body and heal from those experiences and um, and find my own way of of determining good and goodness in my body and then deciding that actually my body is good exactly the way it is and um, and that that the societal norms that try and tell me what's not good about my body um, hmm. I, that I don't have to, that I can heal from those, if that makes sense. Um, so that that's sort of the initial things that come up for me when I think about my body or body in general. Um, there are definitely so many layers, um, so many layers to it for me <clears throat> and so much to unpack. Um, yeah putting the piece back for now. They're my initial thoughts. Um, thank you, Jace. I mean, that is really uh, interesting. I think, uh, and, and thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I think I can, I can start by uh, maybe sharing by uh, joining into my experience of how I, mm -hmm. I relate to my body. Uh, and just see how how we go and how we can uh, develop from that. So for me, uh, I come from a background that is very cultured. <laughs> you know our our African cultures, um, and and how much uh, we are required to to live accordingly to a certain set of rules, um, and um, also in my country. It's it, my country is highly religious, you know. Um, we claim to be a Christian uh, nation, you know. So, so, so the, the Christianity is very strong. So I also grew up going to church uh, at the same time. Um, so I mean, when I was a kid, to be honest, I did not because I grew up in a very rural background. So I did not, I did not have innocently i did not have any problems with my with my body because i did not know anything about it but i think what um what i was facing most was just like uh hey you look like um a woman oh my god you talk like a woman uh you walk like a woman you know um and um i i remember um, i grew up playing with so many toys uh you know like these barbie dolls teddy bears uh and we have like this whole play we'll be playing you know like the pretend games where you're playing as um having a little house a little family so that was that's how i, I used to play so i used to play with a lot of uh girls um so i remember if i would go and try to play with my brothers let's say to play soccer or to hit the kettles and stuff they would literally chase me out uh, chase me away to say hey you are not a man go and play with other women uh you know and then when you are uh, with the women then i am told hey, hey you have to go and play with the other boys and be called so many names so um, so that was how my childhood was pretty much um 
But then <laughs> I moved to the city where, um, and, and I was now, I think around uh, 16 and I'm fully growing into becoming, my, my body is, I, I, I am growing into my body. And I thought that that childhood uh, pressure uh, will finally leave me, you know. But then uh, it continued being a nightmare, you know. I cannot walk in the street without um, a group of guys calling me, hey, you have to walk properly. You are not a woman. Oh, why are you talking like a woman? Or why do you look like a woman, you know? Uh, all sort of things, like I get called so many names. Um, and And... I was like, okay, so this is this this is also connected to my sexuality, you know. So when I finally fully came into my sexuality, and I was like, let me try to find a community where I can be accepted, you know, where I can feel at home. Uh, I realized that also it was also then really difficult uh, to to come and be part of that community. Um, you realize that. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't looking very queer enough to be part of the Satan group that I was in, you know, <laughs> I was constantly, uh, remind, uh, get reminded of how fit I am, uh, you know, like, oh my God, you're so thick. You have to lose some weight. You don't have to be, you know, like uh, a gay person, like you don't have to be really this fat. You have to take care of your body. And some people would, you know, uh, some people would call me, oh my God, uh, are you taking hormones? You know, uh, are you transitioning? Um, and um, yeah, so, so, so all of these things, I, I literally became began to to hate myself very often uh, because I did not really understood the body that I live in, and 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 that really has a lot of impact. Even though sometimes, uh, you know, when I walk into into spaces where there are a lot of people, uh, if I if I'm going to work, it's like I need to always to try to make sure that is my body. Uh, is my body okay? Am I uh, presenting myself properly uh, around, uh, around the people? And yeah, and, and you know, like to continue, that really led also to a sort of disorders like uh, not really eating because I would lose weight a lot and then I get sick from that. Um, and I had just, I, I did spend a lot of money. And if you imagine like most of my money gets spent into the clothes that I'm buying and it, it gets spent on, <laughs> you know, the products to make sure that my face is looking okay. Um, and just trying to keep up with the pressure. So I can, I can imagine how that could, how, how that can be also, uh, to, to, to other people. And, and that's also the experiences that I'm, I'm uh, I'm, I'm interested also in hearing and, and sharing with other people out there. I put the piece uh, back at the center for now. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for sharing that um, and sharing, sharing those experiences. It's so interesting how you can be anywhere in the world, right? And things like heteronormativity and fat phobia and all those things like it doesn't matter where you are in the world like they show up um i find that really yeah i mean not surprising because we know that we know that we live in in a world where these different ways of oppression are real everywhere but um i think you know whenever the, these these things are contextualized in people's experiences. Um, it just becomes so much more apparent that phew, there's so much work to do. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, I obviously my experience is very different in many ways and yet very similar in many ways um, in a sense that I think particularly the the fat phobia I've experienced and the, um, you know, the, the, the weight loss game and the having to be 
skinny and um, especially, so I, I grew up in Germany um, and uh, I, you know, not only did the color of my skin not belong, but the size of my body didn't belong. So I was always um, taller than all the other kids. And I always needed clothes sizes a little bit bigger than the other girls. And um, I remember my grandma, when, probably when I was like 13, they just stopped making girls' shoes in my size. So I would have to just wear boys' shoes and men's shoes um, because where I lived there just wasn't, and I don't, my feet aren't even that big. <laughs> but at the time there was just this norm of, you know, women's feet are small. And if you are a woman and you have big feet, something's wrong with you. And I remember being in like, you know, school and daycare and wanting to like, I have a bit of a creative background and I love theater and drama and all that kind of stuff. And I would want to participate in things. And I would be told that I would have to play the guy. I'd have to play the man. I couldn't play the woman. I couldn't play the princess. I couldn't play the girl or I could, couldn't play, you know, any of these roles. I'd have to play the guy's role because I was so tall. Um, and yeah, so I think that this sort of, the, the way heteronormativity fat phobia, and then in my case as well, very much racism intersected growing up. Like the message that I got from my body was, you're not right, like you're wrong, you know, similar to what you were saying for different reasons, but it was the, and, and, and even though no one said it, but when you open the magazines and when you didn't get to participate in the play and when the shoes didn't fit you and when no one wanted to play with you, you know, like all those things that they're the messages that are being sent all the time. And they're saying, you're not okay. You're not good. You're not enough. And I think the religious aspect as well that you touched on definitely experienced that um, in different ways, but like just anything, um, pleasure, anything like in, enjoying body was just off limits. Like I remember, I, I, I mean, I'll just, I'll just share that experience is quite vulnerable, but I remember when, um, when I first discovered that my body was sexual, right. And that I was, um, experiencing feelings in my body and all of that I was a teenager. Um, and when, and, and masturbation and things like that were absolutely off limits like I was basically, you know, I grew up in a world where you were told like, you're going to go blind and um, you know, it's like from the devil and like all that kind of stuff. And, um, but you know, you're, you're a teenager, you're discovering your body and you're like, things are feeling and all that kind of stuff. And I actually developed a stomach ulcer because I was feeling so guilty for experiencing any kind of, you know, pleasure in my body. So that, so that again, the intersections, you know, you're already not enjoying being in your body because it's too large and it's too melanated and it's too, all of that. And then now these, you're growing into being a sexual being and that's not okay because you're gonna go blind. So you get sick, like your body actually, my body actually got sick from a lot of the shame um, that was attached to it. And it was only many, many, many years later, like as I sort of started crawling out of the systems that I had been put into, moving away, similar to you, you know, moving to the city, thinking I can belong there, and then not being enough that either. So, you know, with black people, I wasn't black enough. With white people, I was too black. With, you know, Christians, I was too rebellious. And, <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it's been a real, real journey to, to heal my eyes. Like, I think one thing I've been thinking about a lot in that context is I can't change everybody around me, right? Like, of course I can work to dismantle systems as much as I can, but ultimately I can't change what everybody else thinks. But can I change what I think? Can I really heal? You know, there's a statement that says beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. And so I got thinking that maybe my eyes needed healing. 
because they were conditioned to find only particular things beautiful and acceptable. So I couldn't change everybody else, but maybe I could change, heal my eyes um, so that I could start seeing beauty in me and in the largeness of my body and in all those types of things. So that's a journey I'm on. Um, yeah, that's a journey I'm on. I think that's sort of my, in a nutshell, my experience um, around around my body and around growing into my body. Putting the piece back. Do we have to do the piece thing? Because there's only two of us. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, I can't hear you. It's okay. Yeah. okay. I, I mean, we know that there's a talking piece. Uh, is it better? You're cutting out. Oh yeah, now it's better. Okay, so I'm I'm sure there's a slight delay. Um. Wow. Thank you so much, hey. And I feel like you 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 ended at um. Uh, at a very in inspiring point w w of which that's where uh, I am at now in my journey, you know, trying to find healing, trying to find that inner healing. But before I speak to that, I just want to speak of, you know, uh, as you were speaking, especially when you gave the example of when they stopped producing uh, the, <laughs> the, 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 the shoe size and, 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 and when you mentioned that sometimes it's not um it's not somebody telling you that you are not enough but it's just everywhere when you open the magazine when you see a tv ad and 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 that's one of the things that is really painful uh, that in some circumstances for where i come from uh people haven't fully started uh, touching uh, onto that because then there are these norms uh, that, that have been normalized, you know? Uh, for example, I know that I, I come from uh, Zimbabwe, a country dominantly for black people, but you know what, I feel too black because I am reminded every day of how dark I am, you know? And you can see that already uh, in African countries when most, a lot of people are on this wave of uh, skin bleaching, skin lightening. I am not saying that skin bleaching and skin lightening is wrong, you know? I mean, if it is, if it is what you want to do with your body, then it's part of your journey. Um, uh, and, and, and I totally accept that. But it's only that when the motive of doing that is coming from, uh, you know, self-hurt, uh, sort of hate and shame that you know what my melanin is too dark so i have to be a little bit light so that i, I can look better on instagram filters or on snapchat filters so there's that and and, and uh i remember having a conversation with one of my uh, niece and Sorry, Irving, oh, can you repeat that sentence? You were cutting out again. You were, the last thing we heard was when you said um, about skin bleaching products and all of that, that if you do it for the Instagram filters, then that's something that needs to needs to be looked at. And then you cut out. Uh, okay. No, so uh, is, is it better now? Can you hear me better? Oh, thank God. So I was saying that, um, I was having a conversation with my niece and a friend uh, this other day, and we were talking about, you know, for example, how uh, most of the young women uh, are, are being brought and and being taught that, um, and being taught that you know the, your body is not yours, you know, like uh, you have to. Uh, instead, you have to take care of your body uh, for somebody to love it. You know, for example, you have to to nurture your body in this specific way for a man, uh, so that you get, um, uh, you know, you become a good wife or you become, yeah. And 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 it's so it's so it's so it's so disturbing how the culture emphasizes 
on that notion and also then religious uh the religion also really emphasize on that like the they they really mold a shape of what is a, a good woman what is this and that of course maybe that might be speaking a little bit beyond the bodies uh so just to, to realize that uh it it really yeah it, it pains me a little bit um and and we still have other areas where people are doing um you know like uh genitalia mutilation it's very it's 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 not as much as it used to be a long time back but you know there are still those elements that are that are still rooted into that and um okay so uh, where, where where was i going with my train of thought um let me just take a breath a little bit um okay i remembered what i wanted to say so i was going to say that um and then this stereotype or this narrative of bodies um how you know like how much it is so embedded into the systems that governs us into the systems that we live by every day you know uh, that is something that is really frustrating that even sometimes when i feel like okay um i am trying to find healing every day uh, you know i'm trying to to i write on my mirror you know uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder but when i go out there when i want to go to work you know you have to dress right your body you know there is a body that sells better and uh your body you can be the receptionist you don't have to be on this position or you know like how looks have literally been embedded into the systems of everything that we do every day uh of which then that makes a lot of uh imaginalized bodies not really fit in in the system no matter how much we try it's like every day it's a constant reminder and it's a constant fight um yeah and and then now uh, to come to to in alignment with what you were speaking of um to what you were speaking of of healing you know i realized for a long time that sometimes following the bandwagon uh is a little bit easier than trying to find healing uh within myself uh and it feels comfortable uh when i fit in you know this is when i i i i i this is i remember falling into a habit of investing so much of my resources my energy my passion my job my family uh so that i can fit in so that i can fit in and for almost like four years trying to fit in because i was like i did not have the courage i did not have the courage because to be honest it takes a lot and it hurts to heal you know it's not an easy uh, process especially with these uh, reminders that are around every day you know and 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 i always constantly ask myself the question of why does it have to be me who has to do the work because i come into my house and i do the work to accept myself in my shell in my body but then the moment i go out uh the world does not accept me so it's just like you know why does it me who have to do the work all the time that way that's where this frustration was happening but then um i remember there's a point when i finally managed to find courage and apparently the courage did not come into into uh, explicitly looking at my body but it came through a question that was bigger than that uh you know i remember i went through a process when i was asking myself who am i really you know as a person what do i love to do in my world in the world like what is my contribution and what's what what gives me lead to satisfactions daily you know and i realized that there was so much more than to what i was living like there was so much more that if i choose 
to rise beyond how I see myself. I can be something else, you know, I can be phenomenal. That's how it really landed to me. And I remember from that day, I, I, I changed the way I see myself. And I remember creating this little mantra that is, uh, I choose to live in the world the way I want to see myself in it. Um, because I was just feeling tired of, 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 of pleasing the societal norms, of pleasing my friends. But then, you know, take, having that courage and stepping into that position, it also then means that I have to let go of some things. So I had to ask myself again, like, what are the darlings that I'm willing to kill? What are my darlings that I am willing to kill? You know, because even though in this life of trying to fit in, there was, there was also so much goodness that was in it that I felt that if I leave by myself without being connected uh, to others, uh, I, am, I, I might not do without. I need friends around me. I don't want to be an alone person. I need good conversations and the memories we've created. But then at some point it was like, I have to do a huge sacrifice. Like what is that darling that I want to cue so that I can be able to, to, to finally be me. And being me also means that being comfortable in my body and not to, uh, to give a fuss, you know? Uh, on how am I supposed to be dressing like or how am I supposed to be working like um, but it's a lot of work I put yeah the piece back at the center sorry <sighs> thank you so much for sharing that you said so much I had to like write little notes because I'm like I want to if I if I may um ask you a question um if that's okay um it's, I, it's okay. <laughs> um you talked about um you know you talked about the the skin bleaching and you talked about the um <clears throat> the colorism and i it's interesting because i think the um you know, colorism plays out a little bit different everywhere, right? Like depending on where we are, depending on where our communities are. Um, here and in most places, I'm viewed as light-skinned, of course, because I am light-skinned, I'm biracial. Um, but where I grew up, there was no other black people. So I was black, <laughs> even though I was light-skinned. But, but what I wanted to ask was, over here, we we talk a lot about and we think a lot about colorism, of course, in the context of white supremacy, right? And in the context of the proximity to whiteness being coveted. Um, do you think, where do you think that that comes from where you are? So is it is it the same? Like, is it the, the results of centuries of colonialism? Is it that message of pro celebrating proximity to whiteness? Or are there other factors that play into it as well um, as to why this, this idea of wanting to be lighter is such a big deal? You're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, wow. wow, that's that's a very <laughs> that's a very big question. Let's see. So, from what I remember from my childhood, is that most of the most of these stories that I would hear are of people describing a beautiful woman um, is that, so you can hear, yes, there are stories that are you know, like, oh my God, a beautiful woman is very thick, is very round, dark skinned. But then the majority, like, especially from, from, from uh, my village and all of that, it's like, oh my God, she's fair skinned, she's light skinned. And, 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 and that was being considered as a standard of beauty. And I even remember, so in my family, we had two boys, uh, an older brother and me. 
and my brother is way lighter than me. I remember my mom telling me a funny story that uh, some of the relatives, uh, they, they, there was a point where they felt like maybe my mom cheated on my dad because my brother was just too light skinned. Uh, so he's very, <laughs> so he's very, he's very light skinned and, and I'm dark. And, and even for my own mother, sometimes when she's very mad at me, then she would scream and she'll be like, that's why you are so dark. You know, she would use the local language to say that. And, 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 and which means that uh, being dark skinned was sort of associated with being ugly. You know, so without being told that you are ugly, if you told me that I'm I'm really dark in the local language, uh, it 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 feels very offensive. It feels very um, uh, dehumanizing. Like you instantly feel ugly if they use it in the in the in the in the, in the local language. But then, um, recalling from some of the conversations with one of my uh, elders, I remember. Uh, the, uh, because of the colonization, you, you know, like uh, the first city to be built in Harare, in Zimbabwe is Harare. And, 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 and when we speak of colonization, uh, Zimbabwe is one of the countries that was majorly colonized by the British and it left a huge dent in culture. I mean, they made sure that the methods of colonization they do work here and they did a pretty much good job so you know like if you so when the cities were being built they started building these you know these flat houses like these are apartments uh with uh, different stories and uh and they were making these apartments for 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 bachelors so they were called bachelor apartments because then most of the men would leave uh their rural homes and come and work so the, you know so there was this uh, uh narrative of a men can are the ones who can only work so if you're a woman basically you have to be a housemaid and all of that but then um you realize uh, how how mistresses were being treated and mistresses were these wives of the, how do you call it, of the employed or white bosses and all of that, you know, the standards of living, you know, like how, how trends were happening long back that you have a very same style of, um, you know, straight hair and, you know, skin complexion, the way you dress and the way you carry yourself. So I remember uh, one of my elders, is telling me that you know what uh the moment we started following um our husbands to the cities and the moments we we started to try to find jobs and uh so that we can support uh the extended families you know um we had to be the mistresses that also fit in the system so which means that i have to straighten my hair and uh, we we have this product this is a very long product called ambi uh it's, it's, it was like uh, a skin melanin lightening uh, product you know that you have fair skin and all of that um uh it was a common brand long back you know so i feel like also then there might be influence uh from that because uh here the white uh people were leaving the standards of what a good life is and so if my husband left the city and went i left the rural home to go to work to the city if i follow when i come back to the rural home i have to look like i'm a wife of somebody who's working so i have to meet the standards uh of of those examples so i also yes yeah, so i strongly feel that there are also connections uh to that but interestingly it feels like it stretches uh beyond uh, that even in the culture itself yeah wow thank you for sharing that um yeah so it's so interesting that we're landing at this conversation um at this point of the conversation um because it's it's very much a conversation over here at the moment about colorism and how it plays out and in society so yeah thank you i mean you you said so many other things that were so brilliant you made the statement you said um <clears throat> that it hurts to heal um and that you know it feels so unfair that we 
you know, it's not our fault that we were born into a system that tells us that our bodies aren't right. And yet the only way out is if we take responsibility and ownership for it. And that seems so unfair. Like that seems so, um, you know, how, how, how's that fair? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't, I didn't put myself here. Like I didn't make the system want people to be skinny and white and have long flowy hair. <laughs> um, and now I have to get myself out of it. Um, but I was reminded of, um, of, uh, Malcolm X, brother Malcolm X, X, he was talking about um, one of the things he would often say is that, you know, it's not our fault that we were oppressed, but only we can liberate ourselves. Like we can't wait for anybody else to liberate us. And um, <clears throat> whilst that doesn't seem fair, um, I do think it's the only way. And the way you shared your story is proof to that, you know, because you didn't wait for someone to tell you that you were right or whatever, but you you just decided, how did you say? You said, I, I chose, I choose to live in the world. I wrote this down. I choose to live in the world the way I want to see myself in it. I love that so much. Um, but you know, it, it's, it goes to show that actually this, the liberation and the, um, the deciding that we're no longer going to live by these standards that were set um, by society or by particularly by systems of oppression. Because if we think about it, it's, you know, imperialism, colonialism, like that, that taking over of and like perpetuating standards of whiteness. It's, um, it's the patriarchy. It's that that then, you know, even everything you just said about women and how they felt like they had to fit into a particular role, like that was brought by white people, like even white feminism and all that. Anyway, there's so many layers to that. But um, so they're all like the I guess what I'm trying to say is the the only way out of them is not to wait for everything out there to change. It has to be us. Right. It has to be knowing that this is going to be hard. And like you said, you said, you know, you have to let go of things. And I feel like I'm still, I'm still in the middle of that with a few things where there were certain places that I've left behind, but some, some of the people from those places are still in my life. And so I can tell that I'm still not my full self because I'm still trying to, I'm still worried that if I'm my full self, maybe I will lose those people, you know, and like where, and, and being, but also having compassion with myself and understanding that it's okay, that it's a journey. Like I don't have to, I don't have to be, I don't have to rush to anything. Like I also need to be safe as I'm going on this journey and, and look after my mental health as I'm going on this journey. Um, so yeah, I thought that was really powerful that, that realization that even though it's not fair, but then I'm thinking, imagine a critical mass of people, because there are so many people who've experienced what we've experienced, right? There's so many people in the world um, who, that are experiencing these things. And, and imagine a critical mass of us was to decide that we no longer buy into these things, that we no longer buy into these standards and expectations and demands on our bodies by systems. I actually think it would be possible to see change. And we are seeing change, you know, like, of course, it's not the, the way it was 20 years ago, the way it was, you know, um, 50 years ago. And that gives me hope, I think. It gives me hope to think that as individuals like you and me and others who are slowly deciding that I I'm going to let go. I'm going to go on my own liberation journey. I'm going to heal my eyes. As people all over the world do that, we're starting to like rattle the cages of the system and go, actually, we're no longer going to feed you. We're going to starve you, you being the system. We're going to starve the system because we're building a whole new world. I don't know, putting the piece back. <laughs>
Oh my God, like I really loved what you say, what you said, you know, um, I find it really beautiful. Um, and yeah, I just want to echo that, you know what, like the journey, uh, sometimes, I don't know, I, I don't want to speak something that I, I don't have to defend later, you know, like, I don't know if I'm going to be politically correct on this one or offend somebody. <laughs> but, I feel, <laughs> but I feel that the journey to healing sometimes because you know we have been hurt like uh, there's been a lot of hurting and, and so interesting that uh, you know this hurt is in so many layers like in so many layers the racism the body the, the body dysmorphic like body marginalization uh, it goes the list goes you know like i'm trying to fight for my for my for my rights as an lgbtq person and you know like they are layers. They are layers. Where I come from, back from is like, you know, I, I come from just coming from a rural community. You know, I'm marginalized. Like, oh, you're from the rural community. You are so behind. You do not know. So it's just like, there's so many little threads. You know, that are it's so intertwined. It can be really overwhelming. And 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 what I come to what I came to realize, and I support, I support the people. Who have done the healing first and who are now ready and have the courage to go and shake the system you know and 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 shake the system i totally support that but i also do encourage people to be aware that you know what what's really important is is to to find inner peace first within yourself within your skin so that when you go and 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 you're trying to shake the system uh you won't get even more bitter, you know, uh, but you, you you find the courage to move on or you might not give up. Because I, 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 I know and have experienced a little bit that the moment I try to challenge um, uh, inequality or, or, or something that I feel like is not fairly done by the system, if I do it without me, me being healing and fun, being com confident and comfortable with who I am. I often get when they backfire because they are ready to backfire. They want to protect, you know, their system because it's benefiting them, of course. So they will fight this also. They're not just going to say, oh, they come, they're fighting the system. Let's just give in in what they want and we move on. You know, they're going to resist. And it's a game they enjoy, you know, especially these days, controversy, controversy sells, this and that sells. So they are prepared for the fight also. And I realize often the moment then when I get challenged, I lose my ground. And instead of going to back where I was in my healing process, I go two steps back, you know? Because now I'm feeling like, why am I even doing this? I'm beating myself very hard and all of that. And sometimes even resorting, you know, to being violent and all of that. So I just encourage people that it 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 requires little steps you know little steps into knowing yourself and 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 finding ground and 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 courage and encourage in who you are and once we know that then i'm really ready to go and join those who are at that stage in shaking the system and also like for for the people who are already in the position of shaking the systems sometimes there's this like you know what oh you guys you have to join us you know like if you're not joining the movement then then um you don't fit in you know you're not joining the movement so you do not fit in this and this and you become a victim of the healing you're trying to find you know i just feel like we have to be to be gentle and acknowledge that and acknowledge that you know what we are not all uh, at the same levels of of of, of self acceptance and finding care. And there are so many factors included. So to really be kind to those who are in the early stages of this journey, yeah, that that is yeah. uh, the pressure on me a little bit and i know it sounds a little bit selfish but i was told that it's kind to be selfish sometimes you know they always say it in the plane when when you're boarding the plane like hey if the oxygen mask drop please put one on yourself you put on somebody else you know and and yeah it's true yeah yeah absolutely i think um you know audrey lord says that um my um 
I'm going to, I'm going to budge the quote, but it's something along the lines of, um, you know, self-care is, is her political act of resistance. And she wrote that when she was, um, when she had cancer. And, um, and I think sometimes we, you know, especially as underrepresented or marginalized people. So wherever we fall in terms of protected characteristics, we feel that the only way to have a right to be is to fight. But actually that's that's the way the system is trying to like get us out again. And so the the healing and the compassion and the kindness has to take priority. I heard someone say before, um, your existence is resistance. The mere fact that you're existing, that you're breathing, that you're alive in a world that wasn't made for you is resistance. And anything other than that is for some people and not for all people. And that's okay, but just by existing, we're resisting and we don't have to put demands on ourselves to like always fight and always, and some people do and that's amazing. And I know I do, that's part of what I do, but I, I could never ask it of someone else because exactly what you were saying, like just the other week I was um, doing anti-racism training and someone, this was really ugly like on on the on the call in terms of they were really mean and really racist you know and that always triggers something for me and then i have to go back and i have to talk to my therapist and i <laughs> like i have to go through all of that and that isn't for everybody and that doesn't mean that we're not all part of the movement the mere fact that you're existing if you're in any type of protected characteristic or underrepresented community, the fact that you exist is your, that's your contribution to the movement. Just keep breathing, keep living, you know, keep healing and looking after yourself. That's your commitment and part of the movement and of the resistance. And I think you're so right. So many of us who are, I don't know, activists or whatever, we can get a bit, you know, overexcited and be like, come on everybody, you know? But I think we have to remind ourselves and remember that just our people existing, who, whatever we mean by our people, you know, people in bodies that are differently abled, people in bodies that look different, like whatever we are, our existence is resistance. And so that, yeah, is so, 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 so important. And doing it for ourselves as well, rather than for others. I know I've, I've often felt like I owe somebody else that I get fixed or that I heal. You know, it wasn't about healing, but it was about fixing and actually making that shift and going, no, 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 this is healing for my sake, just for my sake, not for anybody else um has been so important in that journey and and then and then it's so lovely because then you start getting to see yourself and others with compassion i think if we're not compassionate to ourselves we don't we're not compassionate to others right so if we're hard on ourselves and we're like you have to change you have to heal like heal now <laughs> then we're going to be demanding that of other people whereas if we embrace our humanity and show compassion to ourselves and kindness to ourselves, then that's what allows us to be compassionate and kind to others as they are on different parts of, of their journey. Um, yeah, your existence is resistance. I, I, really I really love that, like your existence is a resistance and how, um, and how, but also I just remembered that I do not exist alone. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I exist with others. So in the process of being compassionate to say, you know, your existence is already enough, but also then to encourage you that whenever you are ready, come in so that we belong together, you know, so that you're not necessarily alone. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, I think we have like, like um, five minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we are coming to, to the wrap up of this conversation. And I just wanna say that I'm so grateful. You know, I was just like, oh, 
wow, it's going to be the two of us, you know, what are we going to be talking about? <laughs> but I just realized that, you know what, sometimes it, it doesn't have to be so many people to have the right conversation, you know, and I deeply feel uh, very grateful and satisfied that I got to meet you and, and, and really uh, uh, dialogue um, with you. And I've, I've really, I'm, I'm taking a lot with me that I'm going to be reflecting and also bring in my, in my, in my journey. Yeah. Same. I don't you. know if you, same. yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, I feel absolutely the same. I am like, I can, I felt my heart just swell a bit in my chest, you know, um, I'm very, very grateful that we got to share this space together and have this conversation. I feel very enriched. I have lots of notes on my post-its from what you said. <laughs> um, thank you. Mm. Uh, and and you mentioned that you, uh, you're an activist. We all are activists, right? Uh, um, yes. So I'm, I'm I'm mainly doing my work in. Um, so I am I am a process consultant and a facilitator. So basically, most of the time, I'm creating spaces for different people to engage in dialogue. But then the major area of my uh, where I found my passion really burning so bright is uh, advocating for the LGBTIQ plus rights in Zimbabwe. So that's the work that I've been doing. And I just want to share a little bit with you, like maybe I may send you an email later, or but it's um, it's on. Um, the work of Margaret Whitley uh, mm -hmm. and her work, uh, she does what is called uh, the warrior of the human spirit. And, mm -hmm. and, and most of her books she has published and all of that really reminds me a lot of what you were saying about being compassionate mm -hmm. uh, when we are engaging in our work for the human spirit, you know, that we don't have to be aggressive or to fight you know because that's that's how the system was created you know trying to fix things and all of that mm -hmm. but if you want to make change that stays longer for our for generations to come for our children how can we get out of this vicious loop of trying to fix things violently but then to approach with human kindness and compassion uh, i'm sure you might love some of her work yeah. yes sounds yeah. wonderful i'd love to and please please connect i would love to stay connected um mm. if you're happy to and your work sounds incredible so you know if there's any way i can lend my voice or anything to to support what you do definitely you know, sure yeah. I'm, I'm sure there are possibilities. So maybe, maybe in this last minute, uh, if you can just share a little bit of more of your work, I'm, I'm, I'm dyingly curious. Yes. Okay. Cool. So I am, uh, I'm a writer and a speaker, and uh, I do anti-racism work, particularly. So I'm an anti-racism educator. Um, write about all different things. So everything I do is around social just, uh, social change. Um, mental health, spirituality, and the arts. And I'm also um, the founder of a, a consultancy called Beloved, which is all about bringing beloved community into workplaces and making workplaces mm -hmm. safe um, and equitable and fair for people from all intersections. Um, yeah, so there are all the different things I do. I do workshops, I write articles, I just do random things, um, but yeah. Yeah, so people can connect with me if anyone wants to connect with me on social media. It's just mm -hmm. at Jess Valley. Um, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we will continue this in Discord. We are being called to, to leave the room. But thank you so much. Yeah, have thank a very you. great day. You too. Thank you so much for speaking with me. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. -bye. Bye.